Gary Nolan says he doesn't trust Arrow in a whole lot more. It's time for another UFO News Roundup. So get in here. This is Jack with Cosmic Road. I'll talk about UFOs and the paranormal. Please hit like and subscribe and let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Okay, here goes. Here is what Gary Nolan had to say on that UFO podcast. Uh, so I, I still don't. I mean, I'm just going to be honest to the people at Arrow. I don't trust you yet. You have quite a bit to do. Uh, to basically prove to me that you're not just a disinformation or a flypaper operation. Prove to me. I mean, I, I held my tongue for two years uh, or so after Arrow came out, and um, you've only so far proven that uh, you're not capable of being, um, let's say, a neutral player in this. Uh, so do better. Yeah, do better, Arrow. Yeah, stop spreading lies and disinformation. And Gary Nolan himself says they have a lot to prove to prove they are not a disinformation outfit. So as of right now, it sounds like Gary Nolan thinks they are a disinformation outfit, which is awesome. I love that somebody as prominent as Gary Nolan is talking about this. That is amazing. And of course, he is in a position to know, which makes it all the juicier. You get him, Gary. Uh, wh what do you think? Is there hope that Arrow can prove they are not a disinformation outfit? Can they can they change their stripes? Is it possible that a new director of Arrow came in with a new vision, uh, possibly with a new mandate of more uh, transparency? Um, could things change? Could things change? And how likely is it that that could happen? With more Congress people getting on board, talking about this, putting pressure on Arrow, passing laws to give Arrow oversight, uh, or possibly if that law gets passed, uh, could we see a new day dawn for Arrow? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. All right. Meanwhile, check this out. This is really cool. Uh, possible evidence of work reclaimed and resurfaced by a later Egyptian culture as the more ancient megalithic sarcophagus had already been constructed with a deep scoop and the later culture decided to decorate it with hieroglyphics. Uh, yeah, because uh, one of the best ways or the only ways we have to date some of these ancient artifacts is by the hieroglyphics that are placed on them. But it appears in many cases that the hieroglyphics were placed on there much later by a different group of people. Uh, and this is one example of that, or one possible example of that. It's unlikely that the uh, uh, originators of this artifact would have uh, done hieroglyphics on this curved surface like this. This does not seem to have been something that would be in keeping with what they normally did. So very likely a later culture uh, putting their own stamp on a much older artifact. And we see this time and again uh, in, in uh, relics from ancient Egypt. We don't know how old that stuff is, guys. We don't know how old that stuff is. I love it. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Don Phillips' remarks are really making the rounds lately. I've been seeing this again and again on Twitter or X. Uh, and I talk a lot about Don Phillips, and I've gone through his comments before about how beings were working with Lockheed Martin Skunk Works engineers to develop a training device for pilots, human pilots, to learn to fly our own UFOs. And I usually focus on that when I talk about Don Phillips, but he also had some other really intriguing things to say. Uh, so uh, let's give a listen to some of that. Uh, we can safely say that yes, there were some captured craft from 1945 or 47, was it? Uh, in Roswell, New Mexico, and yeah, they were real, and yes, we really did get some technology from them, and yes, we really did put it to work. Yes, we did. And one of the interesting things about him, one of the open questions that I have for Don Phillips, who, of course, was a Skunk Works engineer that worked on the SR-71 Blackbird, he even called the Blackbird his baby. Um, and, of course, that's the SR-71 Blackbird, one of the coolest planes ever put into motion. Uh, well, that came out in the early 60s, right? Well, this is what planes look like in the early 60s, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the military jets. Now, admittedly, uh, SR-71 was, was for a very different purpose, but it has a very intriguing and unique design that recalls uh, drawings of the Roswell Stingray craft. So uh, 
could some of what he worked on be reverse engineered alien tech? He doesn't talk about him specifically uh, having access to that tech, but he does say it was there. So let's go and uh, give a listen to some more of what he has to say. And we can thank people in the United States Army to have the foresight to put these into industry for the benefit of the, of, of the people of the world. I know this to be a fact. We put it to use, but it took us a long time to figure out what it was and then figure out how we can use it and then what to use it for. And are those products useful for humanity? I didn't see the craft, nor did I see the bodies, but I certainly know some of the people that did. And of course, they're much, you know, they're passed on now uh, from their earthly bodies. But there was no question uh, that there are people or beings from outside the planet that have lived here for a long time. And it isn't just something new that's been happening in the last couple of years. There's been NATO research conducted, uh, joint, uh, joint research, joint meaning many different countries. And this has, it's been documented uh, as to who those races are and their population at that time. And uh, this was back in the early 60s. This is when I, I know that it's some of the technologies that came out of the Roswell incident, the technologies meaning that which came with the e extraterrestrial craft. It took a while to figure out how they worked before we knew what to make from it and then how to get it into industry. How can it benefit the people? Yeah, it's unclear how much we got out of it and how much uh, we know about what we got out of it. If you've read The Day After Roswell by Colonel Corso, you might have gotten the impression that uh, we got an awful lot out of it, like Kevlar and fiber optics, uh, even computers, even modern computers. However, um, the ghostwriter of The Day After Roswell took a lot of liberties with Corso's material and information. It's unclear to me how much we actually got out of uh, farming that technology out, uh, this alien technology to the private companies. Uh, I'm sure we did, but I am very certain we got a lot more behind the scenes uh, than in front of the scenes. So let me know, do you think uh, Kevlar, fiber optics, and modern computers all came from alien technology, or do you think we developed that on our own? Either way, it's fascinating some of the things that Don Phillips talks about. He even mentioned something akin to a census of the alien population on the planet. He says we knew what races and we knew what numbers, how many of each race were on the planet. There's an alien census, guys. There's an alien census. I love it. I love it. Who goes around knocking on alien doors saying uh, how many are in your household, right? <laughs> how does that work? How does that work? I don't know. I don't know, guys, but it's some juicy stuff. It's some juicy stuff. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Ross Coulthard a few weeks ago was making uh, some interesting comments. He's saying, it says a lot that the Iranians can deliver a more illuminating report into the phenomenon of UAPs than the American government. This is fascinating. Check it out from Chris uh, Spitzer. Uh, as promised, here is a small glimpse of the 2010 Iranian UFO report given to the IRIAF. Seven pages out of more than 300, that is. I did not count the cover. This info was kindly provided in December 2017 uh, by that account right there, uh, who used to work for the Iranian Ministry of Defense. And here you go is the actual report itself. Uh, topic of project, identifying and studying unknown and luminous flying objects in the country, Iran, uh, in their airspace within the past two years and confronting them, and confronting them. So they were actually intercepting these objects, uh, supposedly, or uh, apparently. Uh, there were reports of communication breakdowns between air defense radars following UFO sightings over Iraq. Those disruptions were followed by the commencement uh, of coalition military operations. Mass UFO sightings in Iran after the Islamic Revolution occurred in several distinctive periods. Very intriguing. Uh, UFOs often seem to show up during wartime and times of conflict. So very intriguing. 
During the revolution, when the Muslim student seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979, for the second time just prior to the start of the Iran-Iraq War, for a third time, UFOs were spotted widely over all Iran in 2003 and 2004. So it sounds like they had a major uh, UFO flap in the early 2000s in Iran. That's wild. You never hear about any of that in America. Considering an absence of direct political, economic, slash socio-cultural and military relations between Iran and the U.S., it is of paramount importance that we categorize these phenomena as very serious threats against our country's national interest. The following is a list of UFO sightings with potential threatening nature across Iran following the Islamic Revolution. Uh, yeah, uh, momentary disappearances, very fast speed tracking slash interception, extreme maneuverability during tracking, tracking and interception, presence of a gaseous mass around the UFO, disappearance during presence of any threat. Uh, so super intriguing. So they were trying to intercept these objects. It doesn't sound like they had a lot of luck in shooting them down, uh, which I mean, I guess is a good thing unless they are nefarious beings. However, I'm uh, way more worried that the UFO control group is actually working with the bad guys and shooting at the good guys. Uh, but either way, Iran was intercepting these objects um, uh, and having uh, mass UFO flaps uh, in the early 2000s. Super intriguing stuff. So thank you, Chris uh, Spitzer and Ross, for this information. Uh, just great stuff. Great stuff. Um, meanwhile, check this out. This is really interesting. Um, from the Daily Mail. Uh, UFO sightings over Brazil, Argentina, and Chile leave experts baffled. Uh, strange luminous rods. Let's go. Let's go into the immersion thing. Strange luminous rods have been caught on camera in the skies over South American countries in the past month. The long white and blue objects appear to slowly float across the sky in videos filmed by residents of Argentina, Chile, and Brazil. One stunning example was filmed on April 29th by UFO researcher and Petrobus engineer uh, Ronnie Burnett on cameras he set up to monitor the southeastern night sky near Rio uh, de Janeiro. An apparent cylindrical object glides into the frame, uh, heading northeast and gradually moving out of sight over uh, about 20, 80 seconds. Let's see if we can see any of that in here. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Check it out. Let's see what Ronnie Vernon has for us. Um, now, this says Mendoza, Argentina. Is that the same video? All right, but let's check it out. Here we got these uh, cylindrical UFOs over South America. So, yeah, I mean, South America is such a hot spot. But as we've just seen, there's hot spots all over Iran. Everywhere has these objects. People like to say, why do UFOs only show up in the U.S.? They don't. <laughs> uh, and these are some uh, some great captures from South America. I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of the rods. I don't think uh, those are the rods that people talk about when they talk about the rods. Um, those are the little fleeting objects, the tiny, small, uh, uh, very fast objects or whatever they are, camera artifacts, whatever they are, that appear in certain videos. Uh, these look more like cylindrical UFOs, uh, or some of them could be uh, saucer-shaped UFOs seen edge-on. So let me know which one you think those are, or do you think it's all a hoax or a misidentified object? Either way, some cool stuff. Cool stuff. Uh, last but not least, uh, Peter Maxwell Slattery tells us what it's like to interface with the UFOs that he is often in contact with. This is really cool. I'm interfacing with them sometimes when I'm filming the craft, like through my third eye, I can see on board the craft and I'm, I'm communicating, which I try. Oh, really? The, what can happen is also the, the mind's eye oh, can turn into like two screens to where you're seeing them. And then oh. let's say this, because sometimes when you, I'm physically interacting with them and I'll, I'll go into non-physically as well, I could be looking at them. And in my mind, while I'm looking at them, my mind's eyes as clear as my physical eyes looking at them. I'm getting bombarded with information, thoughts, and feelings all in sync with that information. Now, if I'm filming the craft or on the ground, having an experience looking at the craft, I could even be bi-located on the craft and physically still on the ground on it, or we can merge our consciousness. 
I will see them in my mind and I'll also have a second compartment come up in my third eye. So two screens basically is a way I can describe it. And it will be the information they're projecting with thoughts, feelings, and visions. Dad. That, that is super fascinating. And, uh, you know, people like uh, Peter and Chris Bledsoe and others that have these, uh, this contact where they actually receive communication from the beings. That can even be measured scientifically. On episode eight of Beyond Skinwalker Ranch, uh, they had a special on Chris Bledsoe and they hooked up some stuff to his head and they took him out in the field and said, okay, we'll summon some UFOs and let's see what your brain does. So he summoned UFOs and what his brain did was go into an, an intense meditative state instantly and naturally. Like the, the sort they, they described it as, you know, a master, you know, Zen uh, monk, you know, the state that he could get in over, you know, a period of time. Chris was able to go into that state instantly. And when he did, the communication centers of his brain lit up, but not the giving communication part, the receiving communication part. He was receiving messages or communication of some, on some level from the beings. Uh, and that's what Peter is describing in more detail. Uh, he even talks about bilocating and merging consciousness fascinating fascinating stuff guys let me know what you think about that and everything else covered today in the comments below and if you've enjoyed this video please give me a big thumbs up i would sure appreciate it smash the like button and the bell to be notified of future videos you don't miss a thing join me on social media facebook and twitter links below love to see you guys there if you wanted to support cosmic road in an even bigger way you can consider grabbing a coffee mug or a t-shirt in the merch store below or by becoming a channel member because channel members are rock stars and i really appreciate you guys support thank you so much Meanwhile, there are plenty of other videos on the channel, and I'll see you guys next time. This is Jack with the Cosmic Road, signing out.